So Pedram received his PhD in 2011 from Princeton, uh, performing uh, scanning tunneling microscopy on the surface of topological insulators. He worked with Ali Yazdani. And then he did three years of postdoc in the J. Martinez lab at University of California, Santa Barbara. And in 2014, he joined the Google quantum hardware lab aiming on making a quantum computer. Uh, he's very well known for his papers on quantum supremacy and many other contributions. Uh, and he is interested in simulating condensed matter systems with engineered quantum platforms, which is what we are very, very excited to hear about. So the floor is yours, Pedra, and uh, you have one hour, 30 minutes. Would you is like uh, people to interrupt you or- Yeah, I, I think let's, yeah, I think this would, this would help. Uh, to uh, uh, to set the pace, so uh, you, sh you should really okay. questioning. Okay. And uh, I don't know if it's going to pop in the chat or something. You can just stop me and uh, yeah, I'll I'll, okay. I'll I'll take charge of that. So yeah. great. So we'll keep the format for the participants. We'll keep the format the same as what we had for Roderick's lecture. And with that, the floor is yours, Pedro. So thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to be here and talk about our work in the spirit of uh, being a um, winter school or school. I want to uh, start from some basics and then uh, get to the latest experiments and, uh, uh, and, and, and we see how it goes. Um, you please uh, send, ask questions. The first uh, maybe 30 minutes or so, we are going to try to understand what is this object and why are processors made this way and what you are seeing in here uh, and uh, what is qubit, what is coupler and whatnot. So the, the goal is to uh, understand. We get back to this slide again. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so the start point of the story is uh, goes back to 1960s and 1970s, when uh, Brian Josephson realized that if you have two superconducting islands and they are separated by a thin insulator from each other, thin barrier, the barrier is so thin that Cooper pairs can coherently tunnel from one side to another, then what would you see that if the uh, Ginzburg-Landau phase, uh, superconducting phase of the two islands, these are macroscopic islands, are different from each other, then, um, uh, then there would be a, a constant current flowing between the two superconducting islands. If the phase on one island is phi one and on the other island is phi two, then, and if the difference between these phases is if it's phi, uh, then there would be a DC current flowing through them. And if this superconducting phase difference is changing in time, then you get a constant voltage between the two, going between the two. Um, so let me ask you do, you, do you see my mouse? I could be. Yes. You yes, you do. Okay, if you don't, I can refer. Yes, we do see a mouse, yes. Okay, yes. okay. Um, so this is the core of the physics that we use to make Josephson, um, to make uh, quantum processors. And here you see one realization of this schematic on the top left. There is about 200 nanometer of aluminum. You deposit, um, it's going to go superconducting after below one Kelvin. And then you put uh, five nanometer of oxide, that's the barrier, which you don't see. And then perpendicular to it, you come with a different layer of aluminum. Um, and that would be 200 by 200, 200 uh, something about that order. Nanometer would be the size of your uh, Josephson junction. And this is very much loved by us because you can do a little math and you can see that you have a nonlinear inductor. Let's, let's see. If you take the derivative of the current uh, from the uh, current relation, uh, uh, you can you can just do the math and nothing fancy here, but then you arrive at the difference uh, differential of the five is expected time, which you can use the second equation to replace it, and you are you can arrive at the voltage and uh, rate of change of current relation. And this is uh, our conventional way of defining an inductor. So you can move the parameters around and see given the voltage and um, what is this proportionality to change of the current, uh, 
and the prefactor of that you would call it uh, a induct inductance of your inductor and it's very interesting this inductance uh, is depend on this phase difference so it is a nonlinear induct and you can just uh, argue that uh, current, the energy stored is the integral of the power over time, and you can follow the math and you can arrive at a, at a, a flux uh, relation for, for an energy, which instead of being phi squared uh, uh, in like a conventional inductor, now you have cosine of, cosine of phi in it. So uh, this is the basic ingredient. And I want you to I want to walk you through to see how we use that, uh, and uh, we arrive at the Hamiltonian of the transmon. I mean, at the end, I would simplify things, and we get to the famous Bose Hubbard and these Hamiltonians that you're more familiar with. But maybe it's worth the torture and the exercise to see where are these things coming from. So let's start by doing something slightly simpler, but the same spirit, and that is the a Hamiltonian of a linear um, um, LC circuit. Uh, there is a linear inductor and there is a capacitor. You put them next to each other and you say, um, uh, let me move this down. Okay. Um, and you say, um, uh, can I write the Hamiltonian for this? So there's a flux in a node uh, that we need to define, or you can use flux at a given node. One, one part, one metal island is grounded. We just, or conventionally, we call it zero voltage. This cannot accumulate any voltage here. The other side, we just call it phase or flux. Uh, they're uh, related. And you define the flux or phase at that node, being this, this island that cannot sustain any change in flux or anything. It's just single value with this uh, integral of the voltage. And you can use uh, conventional uh, relations to see what's the energy, kinetic energy of this circuit and what's the uh, um, potential energy of this circuit. And you can write this uh, terms and you can write the Lagrangian of the system by just doing a, a, a Legendre transformation. Uh, but also um, in the spirit of, um, and, and you can arrive at the canonical variables, there you go. Um, but also I encourage you whenever you go through these such exercises, you also get the equation of the motion and to be sure you are, you're writing the Hamiltonian of the system correctly. And uh, you arrive at some relation as uh, such as C, uh, phi double dot plus phi over L equals to zero, which is essentially should be the Kirchhoff law. This, this equation of motion tells you that the current going to the left and current going to the right on top are just going to add up to zero. That's, that's all it's saying. But it's also helping you to understand how um, that you have right your uh, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian uh, property. Uh, sorry, this was Lagrangian so far, so you can... Uh, do the transformation and get the Hamiltonian of the system. And you arrive at something which is uh, Q squared plus uh, phi squared, um, essentially being your Hamiltonian of the system. It's very, very uh, expected as the Hamiltonian of a, of a simple harmonic oscill oscillator, which is this case is. This L here is linear. I don't mean Josephson junction yet. Um, so out of the clear blue sky, I'm going to introduce a quantization. Uh, I was told that, um, um, that there, there are better ways of introducing this, but uh, I, I don't know. I would be happy if someone teach me that. So you say these canonical um, variables, uh, uh, they don't um, commute with each other and you introduce this uh, and commutation relation. Uh, and um, and then we, uh, just for the sake of simplicity, we are going to introduce some simplified notions that uh, we would use through the, uh, uh, that you're very much seeing in the literature. Uh, so putting it together, you can simplify it and, uh, or, or you can make it in more conventional way. And you can see that uh, N being essentially can be, uh, you can give a physical meaning to it is the number of, um, is there is the charge variable and phi being the flux variables and then, your conjugate of each other, and you can see that uh, that's the Hamiltonian of the system. So now, um, without repeating the 
obvious parts, we can just use the same line of arguments from Lagrangian and then and to the Hamiltonian and write the Hamiltonian for a trans mod. Now the inductor we have is just a Josephson junction. And the phi squared that we have is now replaced with cosine of phi. So you can see one minus phi squared and then phi, phi cubed. Uh, so, so far the linear is only up to phi squared, but uh, for a linear inductor, but for nonlinear inductor, we have um, uh, cosine to do the thing uh, completely correct. And here I'm offering you some of the uh, conventional numbers we use in the, um, uh, in the lab typically. And that helps you to understand um, why perturbation, why, why Hamiltonians are written certain ways commonly, because they want to do perturbation. And in the whole literature of, of these uh, physics uh, is, is really old and rich literature, perturbation expansions play a much bigger role than numerical simulation. And uh, they're always trying to figure out what parameter is small so they can do perturbation expansion. Um, but I guess, more people tend to do numerical work these days. But anyways, um, that's why you see the literature is written certain ways in terms of omega p being um, a plasma frequency, which we usually take it to be about six gigahertz um, and eta to be non, uh, coming from nonlinearity and the ratio of charging energy of capacitance over the charging energy of the junction. So these are the typical value for you to, to know about. And um, in a conventional way, you can uh, see the uh, Hamiltonian of the transmog. Now I want you to see how we can even arrive at the energy level and do a small uh, numerical work. Very similar to the spirit of uh, harmonic oscillator, you write your canonical variables in terms of uh, rising and lowering operators in here. And, um, and we can go uh, and uh, use a truncated version of these lowering and rising operators to do the numerical work. Uh, um, I have some lecture notes that might be shared with you at the end of this talk or now, depending the the setting. Um, but um, you can you can do perturbation. You can see more detail over there. But um, suffices to say that uh, you can do. Uh, perturbation expansion and get the energy levels, but is also equivalently very um, straightforward now that we have the Hamiltonian and we know how to write n and phi in terms of their raising and lowering operator. We can just pick up a truncated version of it. And here you can see uh, my quote from several years ago, I think is in Mat MATLAB language is very straightforward. You pick A and A dagger in a truncated manner. And um, from there you arrive at N and phi, and then you have a matrix which is almost diagonal, but not diagonal. And you just ask for its eigenvalue given your, uh, your um, you know, Python or Mat MATLAB that you're using. And here you arrive at this uh, celebrated um, energy phase diagram that you have seen for many times. If we have a harmonic oscillator, which is the, the potential of it is those uh, parabola dashed lines, um, <clears throat> the energy level would be uniform for the harmonic oscillator, as you know, and those are the horizontal dash uh, energy levels, okay? This OB to omega. When you have the uh, Josephson junction and you have uh, a nonlinear LC oscillator, um, then the potential would be a cosine, as you just saw, and the energy level of spacing would be non-uniform. The distance between blue and red, the, the first two levels, is slightly more than the distance between red and, um, and green. And this is slight difference be, being about maybe 50, uh, 60 megahertz on top of uh, six gigahertz is very crucial in being to able these levels uh, individually. So when you're, you would not create a coherent state when you uh, apply, a, um, apply a, a drive tone, and you can address the levels individually. That's sufficient to uh, provide you addressability. Um, so uh, we got to couple the qubits uh, before we can exp to create two qubit gates, essentially. Uh, it's, it's not sufficient to have them isolated from each other, only, uh, only if you want to get a uh, 
you can isolate them and you can get very good coherent numbers, uh, but that's not very um, that's not very practical. So let's say you have two um, nonlinear resonators, uh, two uh, of these LC circuits, and then you capacitively couple the flux nodes or the uh, charge nodes of them together. Um, again, you can write the Lagrangian for the system. Uh, you have the kinetic terms uh, and you have the inductive terms, and then the, the energy stored in the uh, capacitance appears in this form. The flux difference across would give you the coupling uh, energy. And again, it's a standard practice to write the equations of motion. You can just do that from the Lagrangian. And you can convince yourself that all these equations of motion are telling you that the current going at this node, for instance, going left, down, and right, they add up to zero. And the same can be said about that current. So with certain convention, this has they got to make sense. Otherwise, you better go back and check. And the rest uh, is just to get the canon uh, to introduce canonical variables is nothing but just a few lines of math. And uh, you arrive at the uh, Lagrangians of the capacitively coupled uh, two transmons. Sorry, I'm I'm cheating a little bit. I'm I'm here. I'm showing for linear uh, coupled systems, so so I know what the terms are. Whenever I get comfortable with what the terms, I quickly replace this phi squared with a cosine term. I'm, I'm mixing and matching. Uh, um, so this would be the Hamiltonian of the two coupled uh, qubits, two coupled uh, nonlinear resonators. We are not truncating to level of qubits yet. Note that uh, capacitance are, are normalized, are, are um, in a sense are dressed capacitances. And you can solve this again numerically. Now you have uh, much bigger, much bigger uh, space to deal with. You have to tensor product all possible uh, um, loading and raising operators. It's got much, much more difficult in, in a sense. And you can you can write a large matrix and you can get to, to see the energies and whatnot. Um, what we do in the lab, the essence of it is that we couple them inductively. Um, well, in addition to capacitively, to, that's, a, that's a small, uh, that's a trick there. Um, so you bring two of these um, I'm again showing you the linear case so I can write the Lagrangian equations rather comfortably. And then after that, we are going to, uh, uh, let me show you, You're, there you go, it's not very difficult to write the individual terms and then, um, and then how the mutual is essentially related. And there's, there's an energy in the mutual and then there's an energy in the individual terms is, is not that, difficult to argue this should be the case. And you can write the Lagrangian of the of this system. Um, and whenever again, I get comfortable, I'm going to, well, maybe here I kept it at the level of linear, um, but it's not that difficult to assume. You've got to replace it with uh, phi squares with cosine essentially. So again, you see lots of uh, changing in the variables. Now you have all these uh, normalized, renormalized or dressed, uh, inductors are capacitance and in, in practice actually it's very difficult to know what value you target for and what value you got this is a little uh, experimental challenge and you know after I know how it should look like I just simply uh, write it for nonlinear inductor so again you got you got this uh, relation so what we are learning so far is that if you have to uh, superconducting if you have to nonlinear resonator, couple them capacitively, you get charge-charge coupling and you couple them inductively, you get flux-flux uh, flux coupling between them. And I mentioned that uh, how to write charge and flux in terms of lowering and raising operators. So you can do that. And then uh, given that we are working in the rotating frame uh, and using some, or some rotating wave approximation, um, detail of which uh, we can discuss later, you arrive at this type of coupling, regardless of uh, charge coupled or inductive or, or, or flux coupled, you arrive in fact at the same uh, terms of hopping term in terms of the, Hamil in the Hamiltonian of the system. And you can put these things together and um, 
I didn't uh, discuss how the U term coming from, uh, where the U term comes from, but you can you can um, use this um, language of lowering and raising operators of the linear oscill nonlinear oscillators, and you, and you can arrive at this bose hubbard Hamiltonian. So that is telling us that if you have a couple of microwave excitations in the system and you let them evolve and interact uh, among qubits, you're essentially the governing equations for the dynamic of those um, uh, microwave uh, photon excitations is the physics of the bose hubbard So they can be in one qubit, one, one resonator or the other. They can be all on one or spread over, you, you can change the parameters uh, if you want to, um, but, um, but at the end of the day, this is the governing dynamics of the system. Uh, okay. Petron, there's a question in the chat, if we may interrupt yes, you. Yes, uh, there's a very good time. That's a very the good question point. asks, could you please explain the intuition for Lagrangian and Hamiltonian connection to the experimental situation? Why do we need both? That's the question. Um, I mean, um, 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 no, it's just one of, I don't think you need both. It's just comfortable to work with them. Uh, I don't know, you have uh, two coupled harmonic oscillators. How would you solve it? It depends what you're after because we are usually after the energy spectrum um, and shape of the wave function and such. So we, it's just easier to argue in terms of Lagrangian and then but then we are more familiar to arrive at Hamiltonian. Yeah, I guess the per, uh, the person was asking something about experimental connection, but yeah. I, I, I'm more not experimental, sure uh, well, uh, yeah. okay, uh, let me... Uh, maybe you can... Yeah, well, I think, uh, but the, what, well, I mean, I, experimentally, okay, I'm, I'm curious to get to the bottom of this question. Um, yeah experimentally uh we are trying to make them and when you are you're trying to uh, uh experimentally in the lab um i mean you really literally do this uh you go and uh um and uh sorry you really go and lay out something which you think has 80 femtofarad and you go and put a josephson junction which you think has this critical current and all that and you really try, it, and then you measure your energy levels, um, and it really, to a very good degree, obeys this. We 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 are designing these things, so we got to have some hold of it. Uh, when you uh, is is a designing phase, you know. Whenever you uh, we you lay these things down, uh, you you got to have some some modeling of them. And I'm telling you, this is a very precise modeling for that. Right. And I think related to that, there's another question. Why do you end up coupling in both ways in the lab? Here, it seems capacitor and inductor. Ah, uh, that's a very good question. That's yeah, a very so good question. So well, um, let me just read it. Just to complete the question. Here, it seems capacitor and inductor end up with same Hamiltonian for two Yeah, yeah no, no. It's a, OK, um, there is a that, that, that's a very good question. There's a little twist I didn't, I, I get to it, I get to it. This is a very big so, question. I, for the person I, who asked the question, that's your answer for now. <laughs> I, I would not forget. Okay, uh, that's, great. That's a big question. Thanks. That was a very good question. Okay, uh, what is this slide about? Okay. Um, uh, sorry, just going back one slide. So uh, just doing this capacitive and inductive coupling seems to get the hopping terms. Um, in the Bose Hubbard model, how are you generating the on-site repulsion? Uh, there are there are, there were terms in the Hamiltonian that I was just uh, sloppy and I didn't um, I didn't uh, uh, carry over. Uh, l l let me show you. I think you would see yourself. Uh, yeah, I should have. Oh right, yeah, okay, I see them. So uh, where was it? Uh, so when I have flux, flux have these eta in it. And this eta essentially is that uh, is that nonlinearity which we call U, Hubbard U. So right. when, whenever whenever you deal with these things to the fullest degree, so at some point they just got canceled, uh, but then many other places this square root of eta survive, and that's exactly uh, nonlinearity. And, and you can see here on the perturbation expansion top middle of the page. 
that uh, you get plasma frequency and this subtraction of the level is exactly that nonlinearity. And uh, I was clearly lazy, but, but here you can see that when you're going to replace them back, here you have phi, you have N, uh, you're, you're bringing this eta back. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. I should have been more explicit here. Okay, so um, our friends in electrical engineering would laugh at us for going such a complicated way uh, of, of understanding what these circuits are doing. This is not what they do. And if you don't care about nonlinearity and you want to know, you want to treat them as linear in the, uh, linear uh, resonators, you can. You should not do these Hamiltonian complications. You should write the admittance and impedance um, matrices of the system, which you can learn in any electrical textbook. Um, um, and and uh, um, and then you can um, uh, and then you can relate these admittance and inductance to the uh, uh, capacitance and inductance matrices, which I'm writing you an example for it in here is a very standard electrical engineering textbook uh, 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 practice. And then uh, um, this equation gives you uh, the, the spectrum in the linearized case. And then you can show off that you're a physicist and you can do perturbation expansion and get the effect of nonlinearity off of it. So this is a very effective and powerful method to that an electrical engineer would approach to this problem, and I highly recommend, because you write these Hamiltonians, you can write it down, this Lagrangian is not hard to write, but it's hard to make sense of and understand the, what various terms are doing, because at the end you have to introduce um, um, diagonal terms and whatnot, and uh, that's, not, that's not super easy. Okay, so let's now understand this picture and answer the promised um, question. This is a few years old picture of the chip um, conceptually similar to what we are using in here in uh, in uh, in our lab currently. Um, this is uh, designed when Charles Neal was a grad student uh, 2017 or so. Um, so the chip is about one centimeter or so. And on the left, you see the full chip. It's a pattern of aluminum with photolithography pattern on it uh, on top of sapphire or on top of um, um, silicon, some inert substrate to hold this 200 nanometer thick layer of aluminum. And on the right is the zoom in and photoshopped version. So we give color to different elements. So you see what each of them are, is doing. And what you're seeing here is um, the capacitance that we have been talking about is this stripe of uh, aluminum uh, is about maybe 500 uh, micron long, which we just painted red. And the Josephson junction is down in here. It's tiny. You don't see it uh, easily. I show you a SEM image uh, before. And then you see this figure eight between them. And this is uh, the uh, coupler. The, the way to think about this coupler is to think of them as yet another qubit, which are about uh, 14 gigahertz in, in, uh, in plasma frequency. The qubits are six gigahertz, but you bring these qubits, these couplers down and the virtual hopping to them causes the direct coupling between the qubits. So um, I think this is now um, um, the question comes in. Um, the qubits, I think, are cap. Uh, let me get this straight. Inductively coupled to the coupler, uh, the high frequency qubit, and then capacitively to each other. Um, and that is important because uh, you're right. When you directly couple them, they just give you the same terms in the Hamiltonian. But if you go through this exercise, uh, which, which um, you would see that um, coupling to the coupler, uh, give, when you are second order coupled, now you get a different sign. And this different sign become very crucial, uh, meaning that you get both positive and negative coupler. 
And this allows you to get zero cup net coupling. If both of your couplings have the same, ter the same sign, there was no way to fully cancel each other. And there would be always some residual coupling between the qubits. But now if one of them have negative sign, um, the one has positive sign, you can, and one of them is tunable, you can figure out which one is which for yourself. Then, then there is a chance that there is a positive coupling and negative net coupling, and then going through zero. Going through zero coupling is very crucial to be sure that uh, their gates are not leaky, meaning that there is a state that the qubits are totally decoupled from each other. And that is why this combination is very important and is discussed in Charles Neal thesis. Um, the lower part, you see a bunch of control lines to come and uh, play around with the terms of the Hamiltonian. The U term is nonlinearities and is fixed by design and there's not much you can do. So um, is out of any summation. Um, uh, uh, but the J terms is, is coming from direct couple, coupling between the qubits and then there is a line to control them. So this J can change in a time dependent manner and four individual qubits. So we have them inside the summation. And these two lines for each qubits are the X, Y rotation and Z rotation of individual qubits. And they can move, they can use to manipulate a qubit in its block sphere. Um, sorry, I made a jump. Uh, maybe I get ahead of myself. I forgot to say. So we got, arrive at both Hubbard Hamiltonian. And if you can find, maybe it was obvious to you guys, it, if you can find yourself to the lowest level, you arrive the spin Hamiltonian and XXYY coupling that uh, probably you're familiar with. So um, now we can call them qubits if we can find the dynamics to, uh, to uh, lowest uh, zero and one level. Um, nothing in the physics would confine you. So you have to just engineer the pulses correctly such that it doesn't leak out of that, those subspaces. Okay, um, so with that, we can move to the next uh, part I, if there's no question. There is no question in chat, but do the participants have a question at this point? Uh, let's see, did I miss one? Okay. I think previously you defined a in, in, in one slide this three by three or four by four matrix. I don't remember. Yeah, How do yeah. You use it to, right, right, to, right, right. Yeah. You're right. Well, you got to truncate to do something. So you want to do numeric? After the truncation, you can go from that matrix to, to normal Pauli matrix or yeah, 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 right. You 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 will see it, right? Okay. A minus a dagger is these two, two corners. So so you can see that with with an eye in front of it, this is exactly your z rotation, right? This is your uh, sigma uh, uh, sigma y pole poly y. You look at this corner. Okay, thank you. And then the a plus a dagger without i is exactly sigma x. Yeah. And, and it, of course, goes without saying that how much you truncate, it sets the accuracy and that kind of thing in the numerics. All right. Um, so that was, so far, was my personal uh, knowledge. had nothing to do with the team. Um, but um, the experiments I'm going to show you is done as a part of uh, this uh, large team. And this is the one of the last uh, pre-pandemic pictures. Uh, um, about 50 some people in here. Uh, the current size of the team growth during the pandemic is twice of this, if the, of this size. Um, uh, but the, the work that I'm presenting is really the work that they do. Um, as, as you know, and I was mentioned uh, about two years ago and um, maybe a little further, um, we have wrote a manuscript to show where we are standing in terms of the capability of superconducting qubit processors. And um, the next, I like to a little talk about this to be sure we understand what was that experiment. And then we get uh, post supremacy after that. Um, so I want you to introduce this quantum supremacy experiment uh, by bringing to your attention that is a bit difficult challenge philosophically also is pretty interesting 
that we are trying to prove that we are incapable of doing something. We want to be showing that we are capable of doing something that we are incapable of. So it's a bit, uh, sounds like oxymoron. Um, and probably there are many different ways to cheat that logic, but that's not what was the experiment about. And I'm trying to uh, uh, remove any confusion. And I assure you there were lots of confusion about the time of the experiment. The supremacy experiment beyond classical experiment is, is really a well-defined computational task. Um, and is not even an isolated task, is done on a programmable case, uh, meaning that any circuit, any, any group of algorithms in that category can be done. It was not a single computation. And we got to convince everybody that the cost of doing it otherwise is really exponentially hard and, um, and it's not uh, feasible. Uh, maybe you understand this better if I give you a couple of uh, bad examples. Um, you cannot just come and say, can you compute a glass of water or ice or something? Uh, um, you got to really make it well-defined. What about this equilibrium, non-equilibrium system you are interested in? And whenever you make it well-defined, that's where we can talk. And you know, if, if your pet has certain um, capabilities to do certain actions, that's very difficult from still being programmable to be doing many different things. So that's another thing. And um, what I learned during the ex experiment was that many times physicists think something is computationally hard and they are just wrong. Um, very, they're very much confusing what they cannot do versus what is computationally hard, to be fair. For instance, they lots of works is published on phase transition. Lots of works is on phase transitions, um, but not every question related to phase transition is computationally hard. You know, uh, all the system probably is acting the same at all different length scales. So uh, probably in fact, things can be really simplified to answer certain um, thermodynamics properties of the system large. Uh, macroscopic properties of the system. Uh, uh, a good example of something which is computationally hard is boson sampling, which uh, in an interferometer in a grid of um, beam splitters, you shine a couple of photons and the photons go and interact with each other and interfere with each other and they come out on the other side and you say, where are they going to come out? And if I, can I, knowing what my system is, uh, can I predict where they're going to end up? And that has been proven to be hard. You might think, um, okay, so if I shoot a couple of quantum particles into a grid that they interfere is a hard problem. Why can't I just do this with electron? As soon as you replace photon with electron in this case, the problem becomes simple. And that should tell you, well, computationally not hard. Um, that should tell you how fragile uh, this, uh, um, computational hardness is. You really have to convince yourself that you're doing it correctly and it's really not, not easy to do so. So you, yeah, I would not be surprised if someone tomorrow come and says that, hey, look, uh, uh, what we have done probably can be computed easily. Although, well, okay, maybe, maybe not to this extreme limit because we took certain care. Um, but, but it become more, the sensitivity of it become more obvious to you as we move on. So the whole experiment really rests on two pillars. One is uh, doing something with high fidelity. Another is to be sure what we are doing is really complex. And there is no hidden symmetries like integrability or something that you're really not exploring the entire available Hilbert space, but you're really confined to portion of the Hilbert space. So your practical problem is probably smaller than what you think it is. So I'm showing the billiard ball in a stadium um, and billiard ball in a, in a, um, in a circular uh, billiard table canonical examples of something that have some symmetries and certain regions of the Hilbert space would be avoided uh, systematically. 
Uh, on the fidelity and controllability, I'm showing uh, water droplets from a fountain to show that um, uh, it's, it's very easy to create something complex. You know, you can toss your keychain up in the air and it's very hard to predict the motion. And that is not hard. You can, you can uh, uh, go to the lab and make mess. We, we all familiar with that. But what is very uh, difficult, it is to predict this motion and have be on top of it. And I try to uh, capture these two principles in the next few slides and tell you how we convince ourselves that we are doing uh, correctly there. OK, um, uh, here is the computational task is well defined uh, that we chose to uh, do. In a grid of qubits, 53 qubits, you see them schematically up there. We apply a sequence of um, gate operation, unitary operations, um, by, by sending uh, microwave pulses to the system. And you can see them schematically, they are composed of single qubit rotations and two qubit entangling gates, which was almost um, ISOOP gates. Not exactly, but we, we know exactly what gate is, but it was not a textbook gate. So Im imagine you start with a zero, zero, zero initial state, which is a state we can prepare with high fidelity by just waiting. And you apply this gate sequence, you have you get a wave function which evolves. At the end, you measure all the qubits at the same time and you get a bit string, which is 53 digits long. Sorry, I'm recovering from a cold, so sometimes. Um, um, and you get this bit strings, which is 53 uh, digits long, and you can repeat this experiment 1 million times a second, uh, and you get lots of bit strings. And the claim is that these bit strings are really truly sampling the wave function that evolve under these sets of unitary gates. And there is a proof by um, Vazirani and his team that if, these, uh, if this is a random quantum circuit, which includes all possible circuits can be decomposed, can be subset of random circuits, this problem is uh, computationally sharp p-hard. And I don't know what even sharp p-hard means. But, but the very big thing that we emphasized in this work is the notion of fidelity. Um, here now we are giving some color to this schematic of the qubits. The, um, the cross shapes are the qubits and the color of them is the uh, uh, fidelity of single qubit operations and the little rectangles are the entangling gate between the qubits and the color is their fidelity. And you can see the integrated histogram of how, what errors are. So the black is single qubit uh, gate operation on the qubits and then a two qubit gate operation. Uh, but you can see uh, much bigger than anything else is the readout error, meaning that when you try to read out the state of the qubit, uh, do you get, get read that correctly? Uh, we measure that by creating zero and try to measure zero and measuring, creating one and measuring one and see how, how many times we get that. So on average, about 4%, 3% of the time, uh, we cannot identify the bit, bit strings um, correctly for each qubit. And you put it together, it would be a big number. So let me go first to the notion of uh, ergodicity and how random and what are our evidence that uh, uh, the circuit we chose is uniformly exploring the available space. Imagine you get a subset of uh, six or nine or 12 qubits and you know they have um, um, you, horizontal axis is the computational basis. And um, you run a given circuit over and over again, uh, and you see, ask at the end what these strings showed up how many times. And the vertical axis is the number of times that a given bit string showed up. Horizontal axis is in some uh, enumeration, some, some random way of, well, not some, some way of counting from 0, 0 to 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and so on and so forth. That's how we're just counting them. So uh, you can see how many bit strings are showing up and you see that when the Hilbert space is smaller, of course, a given bit strings uh, showed up far, far many more times. So um, 
what I'm going to do next is to, after I'm done with this experiment for a given circuit, I'm going to put the most probable ones to the left and least probable ones to the right. So I just say np.sort and that's what you're going to get. So the, the shape of this, this, uh, this distribution now should be a particular shape to uh, assure you that you are a hard random. Here is, here is the line of argument. Imagine you have a wave function, um, um, and this wave function, of course, can be expanded in the bistring subspace, right? Where C is just a bunch of complex numbers. Uniform exploration of, yes. Uh, so by, by random circuit, what, what's exactly random there? Of time Do you change the coupling or? Uh, and, and, uh, no, no, the choice of, you can see three shades of gray for individual uh, qubit rotations. Every layer, every layer, every cycle, you apply a single qubit rotation, which is either a square root of x or a square root of y, or a rotation halfway between, which we call a square root of w. And um, and um, for each layer, they are randomly chosen. But after you chose them, uh, you don't you don't change them from sequence to uh, from run to run. Okay, so for specific realization, you fix those operation for each layer. Yeah, you can see these shades of gray are are changing throughout. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And this is one one circuit as, as and then when you lock into this circuit, now you start betting against your classical computer and say I can predict the outcome of this circuit better than a classical computer and you run it 10 million times or so. Okay, thank you. So, uh, um, yeah, I think there's a, another question which is about how do you measure the state of the qubits if you know what it is. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. How do you measure the qubits state? Yeah. Thank you, so, so, sorry, I got uh, too excited with that plus minus sign question. <laughs> no on, top of, on top of each qubit, you see a meandering line of a linear resonator, and that is uh, that is a lambda over four resonator, like a flute, like a like a pipe. Nothing fancy about that. That has a very sharp frequency, and you might be able to notice that these nine painted blue resonators are not the same length. Each of them is about eight or seven gigahertz in frequency. Um, in res uh, resonant frequency, but they are 50 megahertz apart from each other. When when uh, you send this pulse, um, when 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 the qubit is in a state zero, they are at one frequency, and then when they are the qubit is at state one, they are on a slightly different frequency. It is called Stark shift. So imagine something which is at eight gigahertz or 7.997 gigahertz. And you can send a signal in here and, 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 and kind of probe them individually at the same time by um, sending signals at different frequency, but knowing which one, which resonator was coupled to each qubit and asking this one, is it eight or 7.997? This one is 8.5 or, 8.497. And by that um, number, you, uh, you, you can convert it to zero and one. Is the response phase, uh, res response of these resonator, uh, which is a complex number, which tells you which one, which one you're in. And you can, as you can see, there's one line coming, one line going. And in this line, we can put all the nine tones associated with all these resonators at the same time. That should make it clear. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's a wave the, the, the wave function is, uh, it can be just expanded in computational basis, bit string basis, um, and has these coefficients, which are complex, um, um, complex numbers. Um, they, so here, here's this little subtle logic. 
if, if you have a hard random state, which is uniformly exploring your available space, these coefficients would be forming a Gaussian, the real and imaginary part. And that goes back and forth. If these coefficients are Gaussian or big Gaussian distribution, then you have a hard random state. But unfortunately, I don't have, I, I didn't measure complex number. I measure probabilities, which, which means C1, C1 dagger type of numbers. And if, if the numbers are Gaussian, uh, the complex numbers obey Gaussian distribution, their uh, um, whatever, their number times their conjugate would obey exponential. And the exponential means Porter Thomas. So if you have a hard random state, the distribution of C1, C1 dagger, which we are measuring obey Porter Thomas distribution. If you have a Porter Thomas distribution, that not, does not necessarily imply a uh, hard random, unless you measure in all possible bases. This is one of the things that theorists impose on you and they just leave. So you can say that we have done enough rotations that we practically measured in many different bases. So I have Porter Thomas in many different bases. In fact, you can interpret as the last layer of the cycles as the rotation of the basis. So you can convince yourself that um, you have measured enough Porter Thomas distributions in different bases that I can say that, hey, I have all random. But, but here's the true line of logic. It's not really going both ways at the same time, OK? Um, to be fully disclosing what we have done. Anyways, um, you get these distributions. And you com compare them with Porter Thomas distribution, which is just a logarithmic or exponential, depending on how you look at it. And the vertical axis in here is the distance between the distribution measured and the Porter Thomas distribution um, is, is a KL divergence. It's just separation of the two distributions. Um, and you can see um, that um, the distance gets small. And then when the decoherence effect overcome, uh, it gets large. And I'm showing you for two different choices of two qubit entangling gates. When you, there are certain gates like score root of I swap, they are slower. It takes 10 cycles to get close to Porter Thomas, get to some ergodic state. And there are some gates which are, uh, are um, I swap like, and they are much faster and very few number of layers. You can get close to Porter Thomas. But then the coherence gets over and you start deviating away again. So these are our evidences that this is really good dynamics in a sense that we're getting close to Porter Thomas. So we can assure ourselves that we are exploring the available Hilbert space very uniformly. Of course, these experimentally, this vertical axis has a scale, and theorists want you to be far closer than this, but this is the reality of the situation. The next thing I want to say um, is notion of uh, fidelity, right? We just don't need to stir up this mess. Uh, we just have to do it with high fidelity. So you can imagine any notion of fidelity has to compare the probabilities we measure with probabilities that we expected. So you can just pick up something simple as this uh, P log uh, Q type of um, arguments uh, that compare them. Um, but to turn that into proper fidelity measure, you have to normalize and subtract the trivial cases. Uh, you want to be sure you score yourself zero in terms of fidelity if your bit strings were fully decohered and you could just get them by, by writing them down by tossing a coin or something. So this is just complicated relation, but essentially it's just meant to normalize and then compare to probabilities of the bit strings you measured. Um, with the probabilities of those bit strings coming from a numerical computation. Well, uh, uh, just a clarifying question again. Uh, so, what's what's a cycle? Uh, I think I missed that. Yeah, sorry, sorry, my, but I've been a bit quick on these things. There you go. Ah, okay, yeah, sorry, thanks. Okay. Well, there is a little challenge, um, which is um, um, we're going to go very large system, um, and uh, we are not going to see bit strings repeated. This experiment was done in the 
Hilbert space of 10 million billion dimension. So no one has the patience to repeat the experiment so many, much more than that to arrive at probabilities. So probably strings that you get to see, they're not gonna repeat themselves over. So you don't have probability of measured in the experiment, in the large experiment, in contrast to what I showed you in a small Hilbert space, which I could arrive at probabilities. So this relation, it becomes simplified under these two assumptions or take a different shape, I guess. When system is large and you assume that uh, uh, Porter Thomas distribution is where we are trying to get at, you get a bit string XI and you say numerically, what was the probability of getting that bit string? And um, you repeat this many times and you average them and then the rest are just normalization and whatnot. Okay, so this relation that you see in the paper is nothing but the rather simplified version of the above relation, which we introduced a few years before. Um, again, let's go back to the subtlety that computationally hard and computationally verifiable cases. Uh, um, so now I have to choose what order I apply the two qubit gates. You can see there's subtle differences between the patterns that we choose to apply them. If you do A, B, C, D, C, D, A, B is computationally hard. If you go E, F, G, H, E, F, G, H, this is how in the four cycle you do them and then from cycle four to eight you do them. This become, you can find tricks to simplify those circuits substantially. So again, the notion of computational hardness is rather very fragile. Every time you claim it, you have to be panicked for a few months that someone would just come up with something to simplify your circuit substantially. And uh, you miss lots of sleepless nights and that's really the, the way it is. Okay, so-, so um, we Sir, Sorry, could, could I ask a quick question? What, what was the basic difference between the top and the bottom here? The way you choose to repeat it, you, and what, you, what goes wrong in the second case? You have to look, thank you. You have to look at the propagation of entanglement to be sure that this is computationally hard. As you entangle, you have to entangle the system, bigger and bigger systems. On the lower case, on the classically verifiable case, the choices of gates counterintuitively is such that it propagates entanglement a little inward. So it does not effectively connect left and right side of the circuit. I see. It's, they come up with the term wedges and what formation of wedges somewhere, I assure you is somewhere in the supplement is subtle but you have to really propagate entanglement further and further out as quickly as possible. Otherwise, these numerical wizards would find a trick and simplify things for you. Okay, so the one at the bottom is kind of spreading entanglement too slowly. Yeah, it's just right, yeah. Well, is this, at the, at the, at the moment that you go from EFGH to make your uh, to make your next round of choices at that moment does a bad job. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so I have something which we can simplify and can classically compute, uh, um, and that's on the left. And if you do A, B, C, D, C, D, A, B, which no one could have simplified so far, is on the right. First thing we're gonna do, we're not gonna apply any two qubit entangling gate between left side and right side. So essentially we are writing a 26 and 27 qubit experiments at the same time. They don't talk to each other. This is far, this got to be manageable. Um, and you can see that we can compute the fidelity and everything is, uh, fidelity comes exponentially uh, uh, down. Um, um, we can go with number of qubits or number of cycles, it's, it's all manageable. Um, uh, it's all computable and we can know what we can know what we are doing. And then we're going to get a little more brave and we are going to eliminate certain uh, entangling gates on the very few cycles, but then going down, let's say from cycle five onward, we are going to entangle left and right. So initially the two parts, as we just mentioned, are going to be disentangled uh, and then they're going to get uh, stitched together. 
So that's manageable. Still, we can do, um, we can uh, get the fidelity, we can compute them. It's not substantially hard. But when we go fully brave, meaning that we are ent uh, entangling left and right, um, um, then you can see that um, we cannot compute them or we are offering the time it takes to compute them classically. Uh, on the verifiable cases, still it doesn't take that much time, about five hours to do the hardest case. But on the right, uh, we cannot compute them or we are saying that it would take us that much time to compute. But note that um, we are claiming the fidelity would not drop substantially because uh, it's only a few percent different in the number of gates. Uh, uh, like uh, elided from patch probably has 40 more gates on top of 1300 gates. And full compared to elided probably has again 30 or 40 more gates or even less, maybe even 20 compared to elided on top of uh, 1,200 or 1,300 gates that they have together, uh, they, they, each circuit has. So unless you think those 30 gates are going to totally change the physics, which we don't think so, then you can believe me that we have done, if, if we could have get the red points on the right, it would be very much on top of the uh, uh, green and blue points. You may say this is unfair, your classical computer, uh, your quantum processor is making error left and right, your fidelity is very low, and you compare it with a full exact wave function computation coming from classical physics, and that's not, that's not fair. You really have to give the classical computer benefit of the doubt and allow it to make mistakes. So the computations can be simplified if you allow your classical computer to produce wrong bit strings, it's relaxing it, with the factor of the, of the fidelity. And that is the gray numbers are coming from. Okay, so that's our claim to uh, to supremacy. Um, okay, in the interest of time, maybe I ignore that. Um, let's see if I have time for this. Maybe not. Uh, okay. Um, uh, maybe I share the slides later with you, I don't know, but uh, but this is about the time it takes and the memory it takes to do the computation and whatnot. Uh, uh, well, you might, you might wonder, you might wonder that the whole thing could be um, somehow robust. You know, you get this bit string, no matter what kind of mistakes you make, it's gonna work somehow. And uh, even the random cases are not that bad if you really, there, there's certain protection, there's some basin of it, attraction or something that you're living with. I assure you that's not the case. In a quantum sense, there is very hypersensitivity to choices of the gates. One of the gates I'm circulating in here, let's just change that uh, either in running the circuit or doing the computation. So the computation and the circuit are mismatched by just one choice, one difference in gates. And you can see on the right, that the fidelity drops by two order of magnitude. So in the whole big system simulation, fidelity would go substantially down if we just make one mistake in um, these choices of the gate in our quantum random circuit. Um, so there is a certain sense of hypersensitivity to the choices and the calibration and so on and so forth. So, so it's, not, it's not free, it's in fact hypersensitive. <laughs> This hypersensitivity is not um, only, um, it's not first time seen in quantum physics. In fact, it's seen in classical music still uh, centuries ago. Um, as you may recall, Salieri, in spite of its adversarial relation to Mozart, he confessed that if you change one note in Mozart computation uh, compositions, it would totally diminish the composition. And if you displace one phrase, the whole thing would fall apart. So if we, we're not gonna claim that this is the first time we see hypersensitivity and it's been seen in classical physics. And this is uh, Maury Abrahams, if, if you are too young to remember the movie. Okay, um, where are we going next? I have maybe enough time to co cover the time crystal case. I had several experiments to discuss, but I think maybe I just get to do time crystal first. <laughs> So um, um, the experiment you noticed was uh, highly, um, um, well, maybe I say contrived, that's okay. Uh, clearly in this 
uh, plot is the lowest part that we could achieve in the number of qubits and the uh, uh, fidelity that it demanded. If you go to problems that physics and uh, um, physics community cares, uh, you can see it's substantially harder, uh, particularly in the vertical axis. If you want to address non-equilibrium dynamics problems that people care about, you really have to have much more fidelity to outperform the state of the art in classical uh, computations. If you want to compete with uh, chemists in terms of what they do, because of the Jordan Wigner transformation, and then we have bosonic um, excitation and they care about electronic dynamics, first you need twice more qubits. And then uh, those um, computations, those numerical methods have been developed for many decades and they are far more advanced than what we can do. So we need far, far better qubits to get anything out of uh, NISC. Alternatively, of course, you can say, oh, my qubits are more or less good enough and you make 10, thousands of them put them together and make one logical qubits. So that's not the subject of this talk, the rest of this talk, but I'm just going to tell you where we are, how we are advancing along, along these axes. Um, the way uh, yeah, I have a question about this entangling gate error. So that has nothing to do with the entanglement of the state itself, right? Which, I mean, can you do long time dynamics? That's my question. Right? When you, you when you give this metric, it has doesn't tell me anything about the entanglement in the state. So how no, long no, uh, time uh, yeah, I think this is a funny I'm, I'm maybe confusing two things here. Go ahead. Uh, the two qubit gates um, usually are called entangling gates. The good two qubit gates are entangling gates. Uh, they, they are they are entangling qubits. That's what they are used. Um, and, and then uh, so the related question is how long in time can you reliably, given that entangling error threshold that you have, how long in time can you do the non-equilibrium dynamics? Well, you can see, for instance, here, 20 cycles. And with this metric of fidelity, the fidelity has dropped substantially down. So, um, uh, but, but also note that there is, uh, there is a 400 entangling gate, 430 entangling gate has been used up to this limit, at this limit. So, um, is, 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 is a, um, that's what we can do. We can do 1,000 gates, and depending the question you ask at the end of it, um, there is certain fidelity to it. Uh, but, um, but does the entanglement propagate across the entire system? Uh, there, we have measures I haven't shown you that uh, the answer is yes. For, for a good degree, yes, it has propagated. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, so the way we are trying to advance and conquer this, this uh, very uh, rough plot is by thinking about it this way. We, all these algorithms and all these interesting physics problems can be written in terms of a bunch of gates and a measurement, uh, which we, uh, or an analog evolution and a measurement of, of an initial state. So the Sorry, can, comment- Can you go back to- previous slide, I just get confused about the vertical axis. Seems like it becomes smaller and smaller if you go up, um, but it's the log scale still uh, looks like the same as normal, normal one. So I get confused. Sorry, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a very crude plot. Don't take it very seriously. All okay, I meant, okay. all I meant to say is to do chemistry, you need order of magnitude better gates. Sorry, I, I didn't plot on log scale. I took the log and then put on linear scale. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, so the common denominator of these uh, experiments that could seem random to you is that you're trying to make better gates go deeper do better, larger system measurement, put more qubits together. And we are just trying to conquer this by, by doing more and more. Uh, so in that sense, in my mind, these experiments are highly related to each other and they're really building on top of each other, but on the surface, it may not look so, so much so. Okay, <clears throat> so these are the people which have been introduced by Roderick too, uh, which play a major role in running the quantum, uh, the time crystal experiment. The 
uh, quick summary of time crystal is that can we find a system of many degrees of freedom and many body system that can indefinitely uh, uh, oscillate in isolation. That's what we are after in here. And the second law of thermodynamics is in not in our favor. So we are really having a hard time to do that because any, any oscillation in a many body system that you can imagine, usually you have to either extract entropy from it or, or, uh, or is very uh, fine tuned and unstable. And this is in contrast to conventional typical crystals, which you don't have any issues seeing ordering time, ordering in a space. And that is very challenging to the limit that you might think is impossible. So we elevate it to the level of a definition because it's not impossible and then see if we can do it. This very succinct definition that I offered uh, indefinite oscillation in a many body isolated system uh, can be really decomposed into a couple of criteria. Um, uh, and these are the four figures of the paper, in fact. So I wrote a more extended definition down there. Can, can a system oscillate? Uh, uh, can we see temporal ordering uh, without heating uh, in a Hamiltonian system, meaning in isolation, and for every possible initial state, which is another way of saying many body um, that there is eigenstate order, so you can you can get it for all possible initial states. Uh, I think um, uh, Roderick did a good job in uh, explaining uh, uh, where are these things coming from. So maybe I just jump into the pulse sequence that we did. We are trying to realize a transverse field icing model. So the, there are three layers of gates. Uh, let me call them layers, and then uh, they constitute a cycle, and this cycle is going to repeat itself over and over again. Um, first, we uh, we rotate qubits by by um, around um, x axis by 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 G, angle G. Uh, when G is one, you come from north pole to south pole completely, um, and then you have entangling gates, icing coupling gates. Uh, uh, interaction terms. Uh, these are we call it C phase gates, and they are they can come in uh, any value of uh, phase we like, and then followed by a disordered uh, landscape uh, local field uh, gates. Um, one one key message that we try to emphasize in the paper was that uh, if these ZZ gates were uniform in a very uh, crude argument, you can see that you rotate the qubits and then they would see the disorder landscape and then you rotate them again and then they see the disorder landscape again. And when this G is equal to one, the, the landscape, disorder landscape uh, appears exactly opposite to the, to the qubit as seen by the qubit. So this order cancel each other and it's very hard to see uh, localization uh, to, to realize many body localization in this context. So it's extremely crucial to have uh, ZZ terms to be non-uniform. Um, let's just start with something simple and rather boring. Um, uh, we're just going to rotate qubits individually without any coupling between them, without any entangling gate. Um, these are 20 qubits acting independently. When G is one, they go from North Pole to South Pole and they repeat their uh, behavior. This is a plot of their uh, projection along the Z axis. This is a single qubit physics. And on the far right, you see uh, the Fourier transforms of single frequency. When G is de start deviating from one, they cannot complete the rotation in one, one cycle. So you see a beating pattern against sing single particle, sing single qubit physics. There is nothing fancy in there, uh, two by two matrix. And then uh, as G become uh, more and more away from one, you see the peaks are splitting more. There's nothing uh, uh, magical in here. But something interesting starts to happen um, when when G deviates from one, but you turn on the uh, entangling gates, you turn on the icing coupling. Now you see some phase locking physics that when G is deviate from one, the whole system responds 
is really locked into uh, as if G was one, is, is back to uh, uh, G equals to one case. There's a single frequency case uh, in this case. So um, this is, um, is a collective behavior. Um, there's phase locking. Uh, I'm showing a schematic on the lower left. You see spins that start in some configuration and they flip to another. And then in the third and the fifth is the same. Uh, they're coming back together. And this is some synchronous response of the system. It's been seen in classical physics. Every time you clap and synchronize at the end of a concert, you're doing the same thing. So it's nothing a quantum in here. Uh, so that's not really the novelty of the work. Um, so another, uh, uh, we get to what is novel about the work. Another thing we, we are going to get, uh, we are going to show is that how do we distinguish between the coherence effect coupling to the environment and the internal dynamics of the system? Remember the definition was it has to, uh, it has to oscillate in isolation and our systems are not closed, they are not isolated. But what we could do, we can create a, um, a signal which is only coming from the coherence, meaning that you evolve the system forward with a uh, kicked up icing model, uh, um, and then you evolve it backward. So nominally, it should have been identity, uh, but it's not. And it takes care of the decoherence effect for you. And that is the black curves that you are seeing in here. What we could do is that to divide them or remove the effect of these decoherences, division, which is very simple operation, uh, in fact, is backed up by the detailed physics is really removing the effect of the coherence for you. So dividing the blue signal by the uh, black signal, you can see that the, that the internal dynamic indeed is a stable when G is substantially close to one, but, uh, but when G is not uh, close to one is further down, it seems we are in a different phase. And the, regardless of dividing or not, uh, uh, the signal has gone away. And in the middle panels, we are showing some uh, time, uh, space resolve case. All 20 qubits are doing the same thing. It starts looking a little boring, but that's what it is. All of them are doing the same thing when you are measuring the uh, um, projection along the Z axis uh, for all of them. And you don't see any sign of degradation as you go deeper and deeper after you remove the effect of the coherence with this trick that I just described. Um, the manuscript is really much dedicated into providing evidence for many body localization, uh, which is really the key uh, ingredient to, to have time crystal uh, and to uh, assure the stability of the phase that we have established, that we have seen. So here is a, <laughs> Um, poor man version of uh, out of time order correlation kind of measurement, which means we create an excitation and we go a few sites away from it and we see if the excitation has propagated to that site. Um, the main localization starting from Anderson is the language of, is the physics of absence of diffusion. And we are trying to show this physics in here by doing these simple tricks. Um, so you consider two initial states: one is all zero, one is all zero except the qubit eleven in the chain in the chain of uh, twenty qubits is flipped to one. And you can see on qubit eleven, of course, the dynamics is different uh, for for uh, two values of uh, C phase. Uh, I, I get to that in a second. Uh, but uh, but when C phase values, as I emphasize, has to be non-randomly uh, chosen from an interval. When you're localized, you go to qubit 14, three qubits down the road, and that qubit 14 couldn't care less if anything was happening initially at qubit 11 or not. But when your five value, the, the entangling gates are uniform, which we claim they are not, uh, they are not, um, um, are not securing many body localized phase, qubit 14 still has a very good knowledge of, a of the difference that was initially happened at qubit 11. Um, so let me summarize 
that in, in a color plot showing this from uh, above um, uh, in here with the uh, color plot that you see as a function of cycle, uh, the excitation is not really propagating uh, when, when uh, phi is random, but when phi is fixed number, C phase gates are all identical. Uh, the, the propagation, the, the disturbance at site 11 propagates throughout the chain. And also we are offering a, a line cut at, at cycle 55 or so. Um, okay, so that's more evidence for localization. Now I wanna get to the signatures of eigenstates ordering. And again, the poor man version of doing the work is to um, check lots of initial states and show that for all initial states, the system is doing the same, so uh, we're good to go. Here I'm showing you on top left, couple of initial states, you know, that commonly comes to mind, nil state, polarized state, random states. And you can see um, that uh, in the many body localized case, uh, they all showing the same response. But when uh, when phi is, is, is sing single value, meaning that you don't have many body localized, uh, then the response of the system is really depending what you use. You repeat the experiment for 500 different uh, product initial states, random ones, um, and you can see there indeed uh, the response of the system as it measured by uh, at certain site, I forgot which site, uh, um, uh, is, is very distinct. And sigma, the distribution is much wider, meaning that the systems would be very acting very differently in here uh, compared to the case that uh, phi values are, are uniform. And, and also surprising to, to me, you can see that this initial state, some of them are not really even showing the typical behavior of the system. Okay, so you choose 500 initial states, that's only 0.5 percent fraction of the entire Hilbert space. In this case, the Hilbert space was one million dimensions. Uh, uh, so uh, our uh, role model and our experimental guru uh, would not be happy with this uh, hack that we did in here. He would say that, hey guys, you should really do better than that. And as he suggested to us that we use typicality. Here, here's the idea in here. This is a bit involved slide, just give me a, Few sec a few minutes, I, I get over it. Uh, um, you wanna see the typical behavior of the spectrum. Uh, if you have one state, one just one state, which is fully hard random, you can convince yourself this is fully hard random state, that will pull the behavior of the entire typical behavior of the spectrum out for you. This is the premise that we are going to use and understand the typical behavior of the spectrum. So um, now we have to do a couple of things. First, we have be before we get to our uh, uh, time time crystal circuit, we have to do a scrambling. We have to make a whole random state, and the scrambling circuit is very similar to the supremacy circuit I showed you. Single qubit followed by uh, I think CZ rotations. In this case, is going to do a good scrambling, and we're going to do it for k different layers, and we create a scrambled state as initial state in contrast to the, uh, um, um, the product states that I have been using so far. But I run into a challenge by doing that. And that is these two point correlation functions that I was happily measuring so far. And I didn't even bother to tell you that these two point correlation functions is not really two point. It's Z of zero is just come out of the expectation value. It's just a, it's just a number multiplying it is, is really not a, time, not a genuine time correlated measurement in a sense that uh, it can be computed just as Z of T multiplied by, multiplied by Z of uh, zero. But here I cannot do that trick. Uh, now my initial state is arbitrary, is not a product state. So that trick cannot be used. Z T Z zero cannot be just done read as I have done it so far, but a simple, um, circuit shows that if I had connected uh, to an ancilla with a CZ gate, just measuring expectation value of X on that ancillary qubits is exactly what we are after. So that's what we're going to do. And um, here now, 
uh, again, we are doing the same, all the same experiments, but now we are measuring that ancilla qubit. Um, and again, we do our uh, normalization and removing of the effect of the coherence. And we see that uh, we are again seeing some stable um, oscillations. And we are going to say, what's the magnitude at that circuit, uh, at that cycle 32 or something? And we change the initial state now, and I'm showing you a histogram of uh, the value of uh, ZTZ0 uh, for 500 different uh, um, states, scrambling states that we begin with for different size of the scrambling. With the scrambling is not that strong, meaning K is zero, you just don't do any scrambling, you have a product state. The histograms are widely distributed, but when you do a good scrambling when K is 20 and your state is closer to hard random, now you see the distribution get narrower and you are seeing the typical behavior of the system and sigma over mu get much more narrower. Um, I want to stop. Uh, um, uh, anyways, uh, uh, the last thing we did is um, the last thing we did is the finite size scaling. Roderick mentioned that uh, we got to go to infinite size systems, which uh, financially we cannot afford that. So what we have done is we we went to a smaller system and see. Uh, we look at Edward and there's an order parameter just just to look to see if the long range co uh, correlation survives as we go larger or small, as, as we change the system size. And we see above certain value of G, indeed the correlation gets a stronger, sorry, the, um, um, yeah, the spin glass order parameter gets stronger and better when we go, uh, when we go bigger system size uh, and below a certain value of transition, it gets smaller when, uh, uh, when we go bigger system size. So I wanna finish at least on time uh, um, and I, can take questions uh, now, or, or I, I can ask questions. I, I have a quiz. Uh, yeah, but it, was that your last slide? Sorry, just to clarify. Uh, yeah, I, I can stop. Okay. I, I yeah, so, well, this, yeah, uh, the floor is always open for questions. So, uh, oh, okay. But, yeah. but that's end of my time, right? I, okay, uh, well, yeah, we have a few minutes. Well, it's one thirty, but we can always extend it a few minutes. We had technical delays. Well, let's um, see. Do, do, well, maybe, do I answer your, maybe I answer your question first. This is a my question on the entanglement measurement. Right, right, right. Uh, um, right. Um, uh, here's these other experiments I didn't get a chance to talk about. But in this experiment, uh, this is uh, sorry, I, uh, this is the work of Kevin Satzinger published in a Science Few, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Uh, and in creating the ground state of the Tory code Hamiltonian of, of right. Kitayev. And here is the entanglement the way you like to see it, meaning that you're measuring what's the entanglement of subsystem with the rest of the system. Right. And that's, I think, what you had in mind. And yes, that, that's more, exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, it's more involved measurements. And we have gone to subsystems of size nine, and we are measuring how uh, the system is entangled. Yeah. Uh, subsystems are entangled with the rest. Great. Uh, are there any questions from our participants? We are, we are at one thirty, and I guess people are a little bit tired, I guess. But this was a great talk. But okay. let's see if there are some other questions in the meanwhile. Any, any of the participants? Uh, I, I could ask one question because you, you spoke about these uh, the, the, these Ising like models. I mean, it's, it's beyond the time crystal question, really. Could you realize other models um, like, let's say, XXZ or some <laughs> other kinds of Hamiltonians yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and, and beyond, let's say, one? This is primarily one dimension, right? So, yeah, no, uh, okay. uh, of... yeah, yeah, yeah. Going to two dimension is not difficult as we have shown okay. any and then our, our claim to fame is that we have done random quantum circuit so uh -huh. anything you say would be decomposed we should be able to decompose the challenge is that that decomposition to our gates that we have is not going to be Correct. very effective so right. the particular Haldane model you mentioned I think we can somehow decompose it and do it um, 
but it's better to develop certain nat native gates or certain gates before doing that. Um, uh -huh. so, so I can decompose it into square root of I swap and I swap and C phase and CZ gates and C right. naught, which are gates we are familiar with. Right. But you might as well spend some time and develop a three qubit gate for that purpose. Because as, as, as you saw, after 20 cycles, the coherence effects cannot right. be ignored and uh, right. you're out of luck for the good part. Right, right. So the, that that's the trotter error, right? I mean, you also have a trotter error because no, no, no. Uh, uh, the trotter well, uh, I mean, we, I mean, yeah. Actually, that was another related question. Like, what is the trotter error when you do the time evolution? No, 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 no. Uh, well, we did. We are trying to do this unitary. We are trying to okay. do this unitary. I see. Okay. Uh, if if you interpret it as a Hamiltonian, then yeah. you have to. But the property, the physics is in the unitary is it, it, right. That, that, that's the yes. There is no there is no Hamiltonian in here. Right, right. Uh, if if you write it, you have to do truncation or there are higher order terms and all those kind of complications. Uh, but this unitary is very much loyally is implemented. I mean, you see, it is a product of these three exponent. Is not ex is is not the exponent of the summation of them. Okay, so yeah, we are a little bit over time. Can I ask uh, just very quick question. clarification? Yeah, okay, there is a question from Adam. So go ahead, please. When, when you showed the um, two-dimensional array of qubits, are, are you? typically using all of them or, or do you kind of select a subset which according to which ones have the highest fidelity or, or something like that yeah when we uh, um uh, let me see this this time crystal experiment was done uh, on a chip that only had 28 qubits so we had to is a 2d chip and, and uh, to we select 20 qubits, which, which are connected in a line um, with coupling, uh, but of course the good ones. But, okay. but, but when, you do, when you do quantum supremacy, you're, you're, you've got to use everything. You have to use everything, but okay. Yeah, of course, uh, yeah. There's always a trade-off between a uh, um, Googler who wants to just use the biggest best chip and be done and referee two, which is always saying why you didn't use more qubits. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any last very quick questions before we let Bedram also go? And... Yeah, it's okay. Any questions from our audience, from our participants? Okay, if not, I'll take my authority as chair to end the session. So thank you again, once again, uh, Roderick and Pedram for wonderful talks. It was very educational at least for me. Um, so let <laughs> and, me- And uh, we uh, will, yes, go ahead. Um, I just uh, get this from Kun Yang. Um, oh. I think I, I'm gonna post the um, recording of the lecture somewhere, or are you guys gonna do it? Yes, so uh, this is for all the participants, quite a few of them have left. We have the recordings of, yesterday and day before yesterday on our maglab website uh, which is jan 10 and jan 11 and today's recording should be made available in a couple of days maybe in a day uh, so we'll keep the participants posted and i know that you shared your slides as well i'll think of a we'll, we'll look into ways in which we can share that if that's okay with you and you can you can uh, definitely share this slide the slide right. also for the right but I mean, this talk will be made available on our website at some point and on the Hamiltonian parts, uh, you might notice somewhere I was saying homework, blah, blah. There would be uh -huh. some personal notes I wrote that I'll also share. Uh, okay, great. That would be wonderful. Great. So we, we will find a way of sharing all the materials that you share with us. And with that, uh, we want to thank you again. Thank you so much. And uh, we will end the session. And we will see everyone tomorrow. And there's also a poster session other than the usual lectures. So the lectures are on circuits. Uh, Adam and Romain, uh, 
but uh, yeah, we also have a poster session. So goodbye, everyone. Have, have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> so Aisha.